So one thing that we've got to get out of the way right away with this class is what is my policy on ChatGPT? Can you use it with this class? Is that cheating? Absolutely not. You are learning about how to program LLMs. If the LLMs can help you to solve your problems, then certainly go for it. When you work in the professional world, you'll certainly not be told not to use LLMs, at least not at first, as the companies are getting... Um, at first, they may have policies against it just as they come to understand it, but this is going to become an integral part of how you work as either a software engineer, data scientist, or really just about anyone. Now, coding is in your native language, and it can then take that and generate code for it. Now, that being said, there's a lot of limitations to it. It has trouble bringing large programs sort of together, so it's really good at writing small pieces. But if you follow test-driven development, modern, modern software development methodology, this is an amazing tool. To me, this is one of the greatest promises of large language models. So we'll go through these parts for module two, and we'll talk about some of the limits in 2.5. So for this, I have this notebook here, and I show you how you can use a notebook for code generation. Probably you are going to want more so to use a, an outside tool. But certainly I just want to show you how you can access it all here. So if you want to stay completely within OpenAI, and this is fundamentally the same as going to ChatGPT. So if I go to ChatGPT and I say, please write a program that pulls a, or that finds the eyes of a person in an image and then crops that image to 1024 by 1024, so that the so that any person is a consistent crop okay I spelled that wrong but that's cool it doesn't care of that person this is similar to one of the assignments that i'm going to have you have it prompt and if you press enter chatgpt basically then gives you the python code and it's interesting i didn't even tell it what language to write it in, and it pretty much just assumes Python. That is an example of a bias, certainly. Not necessarily a bad bias, but say I was an R programmer, maybe that would annoy me. So you can take this prompt, you can do that in ChatGPT. If you want more control, and if you do it this way, it's going to count towards your credit balance, but you can take it right here and put it into the into the platform openai.com that you have access to when you signed up to OpenAI, and then you can you you can run it here. You can also put in a system prompt that gives it, say, certain coding styles that you might be interested in doing. So if you run it here, it's going to do largely the same thing, except the markdown is not going to be formatted like it is nice in, in Chat uh, ChatGPT. Now, the notebooks, I do have it format the output. So let's go ahead and run this. It is going to obtain your OpenAI API key, which you should have stored in your, in your secrets here. We talked about that earlier. And this takes a moment to start up. It's installing all the necessary packages that I also want for this class session. All right, everything is all nice and installed. So like I was sort of saying, there's there's multiple platforms that you can use for this. If you want to do hardcore code generation, and that's the main thing you're, you're dealing with, you may want to buy a specialized product for it. GitHub Copilot really seems to be sort of the leader there. ChatGPT is also an option, and I have used it extensively for code generation. It works quite well. You'll be using GPT-4.0 or 4.0 Mini. And then there's also Amazon Code Whisper, currently renamed to Amazon Q. So I'll have to update that in there. This stuff changes so fast. And now we're going to go ahead and we're going to try some code generation. 
I am creating all of this using Langchain. We're going to use GPT-40 Mini just to keep costs down. And I give it a system message. You are a helpful assistant that writes reliable computer code. You could put some more of your coding standard sort of things in there. I'm doing a temperature of zero because I don't want to encourage any creativity much. Uh, you can experiment with that, but the higher the temperature, the more, I don't know, creative and whimsical it's, it's going to be. And then we'll print out the model response. And notice I do process markdown. So I'm going to run this. This just defines the function. It's not going to actually do any code generation just yet. Now I'm going to say write Python code to return a Fibonacci sequence specified by the parameter. So we're going to run this and see it actually generate this code. And again, this is using GPT-4 Mini. You would probably get better code if you took the Mini off, but it, it costs more. So it's a, bit, it's a bit of a balance. And here it writes the Fibonacci sequence, and it even gives you some description at the end. If you're running this kind of thing in an automated process, the, the stuff at the bottom there might be might be a problem, and it's chirpy little, certainly below is a Python function, blah, blah, blah. This has already caused some embarrassment in the academic community where people had chat GPT write parts of their research paper, and they did a bad copy and paste, and they, they had things like, certainly, here is an abstract for your paper. Um, I don't know what's more embarrassing, that they forgot to take that out, or the fact that the peer reviewers in a few cases, actually let the paper fly. Now, if you want to get very, you'll probably want to get a lot more precise because say you're generating just some method function that's going to fit into something much bigger. You need the large language model to be consistent on the name, on what the parameters are called, all this kind of stuff. And not just consistent, you would like to really be the one saying what, what all those names are because that way it's going to fit together with all the other methods that you're having the LLM generate for you. So here I show you a better form for, a, for code generation. Write a Python function named loam amortization. So I'm telling it what to actually call it so that it doesn't just randomly pick some, some name to call it. And then I tell it all of all of the parameters and everything, and I give it as clear of information as I can to stamp out any ambiguity. And this works somewhat better. You might even want to tell it, don't put any preamble or, or other text, only code. But for this one, I don't, I don't care. If I was doing it more in an automated sort of fashion, then I might tell it to not give me any explanation. And here you can see the result. It creates the method just like I asked for. I could have asked also for Python, you know, the parameter sort of comments that it's capable of, of doing. But this is the loan amortization function. I believe this is correct. You would want to do a solid unit test with this as well so that you have a unit test that checks it against some known mortgage amortization that you that you know is correct. And if we want to test this, that it's generated, I'm not going to copy and paste the new code, but this is from the last time that I ran it. And now it will actually test the loan amortization. And you can see that's your typical loan amortization table. At least the way mortgages are very common in the United States, there's a fixed 30-year or a fixed 15, and you have a, you have a amount that you're paying, your loan payment amount, that stays the same. That always stays the same. But the amount of that that's going to interest is initially very small, or very large, and very little is going to actually pay your, your house off. And then it slowly flips, where the older the loan gets, the less interest you're paying, and the more of your principal that you're actually paying off. And it's actually fair. I mean, it's it's when you're early in the loan, you're paying a lot of you're paying a lot of interest. The idea there is so that your monthly payment stays fixed, which is appreciated by many. So now, if you try to generate something that's way too big for it, just to show you, create a Python GPU enabled neural network for. Now, if you want to generate something bigger, 
and you'll probably want to do this with your Kaggle competition that we're going to have later, I'm telling it that it's for Kaggle so that it'll do the right format. I give it the location of where the images are for this, uh, this challenge that I'm giving it and where the data is. So that way, it's not going to go out and look at that. I don't think it's, it, I mean, I know running it in here, it's not that smart yet. But as we get more and more with multimodal and tools and agents, it would prob it'll probably in the future actually go out there and look at those files and see what that looks like just to, just to help it be able to, uh, to do that. Bigger programs like this, often you will need to tune it a bit. Here we're doing just one, one prompt straight through. We're not conversing with it. We'll see how to converse with it for code generation in a moment. And there is all of that. All right, thank you for watching the video. Definitely make sure that you use the LLMs to help you generate the assignments. You'll learn a lot about their strengths and their weaknesses. I really did design the assignments assuming that you would probably do that. So that's really honestly part of the learning as well. You're learning to prompt and have it to create those. So thank you for watching this video and please subscribe to the channel so that you see all my other projects related to AI and generative AI, particularly lately. Thanks for watching.